All right. Um, thank you for the introduction, and I'm really honored to be here uh, this year again. I was here last year, and I was really, really just blown away at how well done the event was and how uh, well the organizers had really done everything. So I'm here to kind of talk about maybe a lot of the stuff that I've learned over the past year, because when I first came here last year, I was just getting into this space. And now a year later, I want to talk a little bit more about what I think of the current state of where decentralized computing is in the sense of decentralized blockchains. So my name is Nader Davit, and I'm going to be here talking about vertical and horizontal scaling and just different scalability approaches for blockchain architectures. I'm currently a, a developer relations engineer at uh, Celestia. Celestia is the first modular blockchain network, and I'm going to talk a lot more about what Celestia is, what we do, and how we are different maybe than some of the other appro approaches that are out there, but also talking in depth about some of these other approaches. So my career has gone through a few different stages. I've been a front-end uh, developer working with JavaScript uh, single-page applications for a few years. I moved into mobile development where I was shipping uh, some of the first React Native apps to the App Store, then started a company called React Native Training where I ran up, went around the world and I taught companies like Microsoft and Amazon how to build uh, cross-platform applications in JavaScript using React Native. So a lot of these engineers were basically writing native code for their entire lives. They were um, either writing Objective-C, uh, Swift, um, or maybe they were writing Java. And that was really interesting because it, get, it really helped me understand how to teach, and it kind of pivoted my career into developer advocacy. But uh, with that, uh, I would say, uh, core groundwork that I had as a developer, um, kind of combining the, the two has been my passion since. So since, uh, since opening my company, React Native Training, I got into really this idea of DevRel, and that's what I've been doing since. I then moved into cloud computing, where I worked at AWS for a little over three years. I was uh, running the global team for front-end web and mobile developer advocacy towards the end of my uh, stint there. And I, at the end of my uh, role at AWS, I started really getting interested in blockchain technologies, just because um, I feel like a lot of the challenges around scaling traditional architecture have been almost solved at this point, and the challenges with decentralized networks and also with blockchains and just Web3 just seem so much more daunting and challenging, and therefore, to me, a lot more exciting. So with the perspective that I have at AWS and with some of these other areas, I'm hoping that I can kind of convey maybe to a lot of people here that are new to blockchains, like why you might want to use these, where, where they would be used and where they wouldn't be used, and also uh, how we can actually bring the, this type of technology to the masses. So let's first talk about a few blockchain use cases. Um, one of the, the main core use cases has to do with finance, and that's kind of the original use case. So access to financial, financial infrastructure, no one needs to actually give you the right to interact with a blockchain. You can actually just go to a wallet and download it. That's a lot different than what we have today. If you live in certain countries and you're a woman or you're a certain color, you're actually not able to even open a bank account. So being able to actually go and just download a browser wallet and start interacting with these different, different protocols, being able to send and receive money is actually revolutionary to a lot of people. Um, internet native payments, stable currencies, these are the types of things that maybe uh, we are used to in, in Europe and in, in North America, but other parts of the world, they're actually uh, you know, revolutionary to them as well. So being able to have access to these sorts of things are a big deal. But the things that actually have really gotten me into this space are not really having to do anything with finance. Instead, they have to do with, I would say, almost like taking the idea of open source code and applying it to data and infrastructure. So public, shared, and composable infrastructure. What if we could say, just like when we open source a GitHub repository, anyone can use it, we can actually build applications that anyone else in the world can consume that they can also interact with, and we can build on them with the same, I would say, um, understanding and certainty that we're building on our own backends, but leveraging others without thinking, uh, worrying about them breaking the next day. So a good example of this is the Twitter API um, in the Web2 space, 
for a while, that was a very, very nice API. People built million dollar companies off of the Twitter API. But one day, Twitter realized that the companies that were building on top of their API were actually doing a better job and making money and pulling users away from their front end. So they started changing things. And then therefore, you were unable to continue using their APIs the way that you would. So what if we had this idea of an immutable back end, an immutable API that anyone could use, and we know that it could uh, continue working? Um, a couple of use cases that we're starting to kind of see come into play as well are gaming and social media. I'm going to talk a lot more about social media in just a moment. Uh, censorship resistance, and again, kind of like doubling back on the infrastructure part, uh, robust decentralized infrastructure, no single point of failure. Um, we're so used to having databases that are brittle. If something goes wrong, you don't pay your bill, you step away for a while, something, I don't know, changes, your uh, application goes down. Um, with most of these decentralized networks, you have the same application running across an entire network of nodes. So if you have 95% um, of the network goes down, for example, your application st should still be running if the network is still up. So what are some of the challenges for blockchain, adop uh, blockchain adoption? Um, there's a few main pillars of, uh, that I would kind of like categorize as challenges. One of them is scalability. That's going to be the one that I kind of talk about the most today. Accessibility. Um, this is, to me, also right up there with scalability, and it's one of the things that I'm kind of passionate about and working towards as well. Uh, user experience and security. So let's first touch on scalability. So something that we know already is that uh, databases scale. I worked at AWS, and we had databases like DynamoDB that anyone could actually spin up, and if you were a good engineer, you could actually scale this to an application that could serve 100 uh, million operations per second, because that's kind of like what actually is being done today. So we know it can, it can be done. Um, even a very novice developer can scale a, a database like this to millions of operations per second, and it just works. So we, we have kind of like gotten to that point where if you are a, an engineer that can build a, a somewhat complex system, then the actual architecture is going to scale. But what we have in the blockchain space still today is that blockchains actually don't scale. While we're talking about 100 million operations per second uh, at AWS, people on the internet, on Twitter, that work at these blockchain companies are excited about 4,000 operations per second or 4,000 transactions per second. And to make that even worse, um, a database that we spin up is actually used just for our, our, our own application. But these blockchains are shared computing engines for thousands of applications, each with their own user bases. So imagine spinning up an EC2 instance and saying, OK, I'm going to use this, uh, this instance, but I'm also going to share it with every other application in the world and all their users. That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So that's just something to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, another big challenge is accessibility. And this, is, this speaks for itself. It actually costs money to interact with a blockchain application. That's kind of dumb, right? Like, if you, if, imagine going to Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, and every time you wanted to like something or every time you wanted to post something or every time you wanted to create a profile, you had to pay money. Well, that's actually not very realistic. Um, most of the time, we barely even like, are uh, excited about using a new application. People have to beg us to use that, much less us to pay them to use it. So, this is just something, again, to keep in mind. And, and I'm going to talk about how we might solve some of these challenges and how some people are already approaching these, these challenges. Um, user experience and security, this is a whole domain in and, to a, in and of itself, obviously. And they do kind of go a little bit hand in hand based on a lot of the things having to do with wallet and wallets and identity. So wallet UX is bad. Security vulnerabilities are unforgivable. If I mess something up and I click the wrong button, all of my money can be drained, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. And in the user experience department, imagine going to Twitter or Facebook again, and every time you're liking a tweet, you have to then sign a transaction saying that you like that. That's a bad UX, and that's the current state of most blockchain applications. So blockchain, the way I just described it in the form that it's being used today, for the most part, actually kind of sucks. And this is someone that really is passionate about, this is from someone really passionate about this stuff, and that's excited about where it's going. But to be realistic, you have to just be straight up honest with where, where we are today. So what are some of the solutions for some of these things? And I'm going to talk about some of the areas that I'm most excited about that I'm seeing a lot of innovation happening today. 
So we have innovations at the virtual machine. This could be seen as like uh, vertical scaling, adding more resources, uh, making the actual execution environment a lot faster. Um, the thing that we're focused on and a lot of the industry is focused on, and I'm going to be talking more in depth later, is more of a horizontal scaling approach where you have this idea of modular blockchains and application-specific blockchains where instead of sharing compute with everyone else in the world, you're able to have your own compute for your application alone. Um, Innovation and experimentation with data storage. So when you store information on a blockchain like Ethereum, that's one of the most expensive operations. So how can we actually still have the, the security guarantees and the characteristics of a blockchain without actually storing all this massive amount of data on a blockchain? Because any smart developer will think about how a blockchain works and realize it's actually not realistic as it is today again. Because we shove massive amounts of data into a database for free, basically. I mean, if you look at it again, DynamoDB, how cheap it is. Imagine every time that you store something like Miner, you're, you're actually you know, having to pay for that. So we have to experiment with new ways to kind of make this better. Um, this idea of relayers and gasless transactions is something that we're starting to see a lot more of today. And this basically just means that we have now uh, networks that are so inexpensive that it's a fraction of a penny to interact. Now, not, not long ago, it, it was actually a lot more than that, like a few cents to interact, which is obviously not scalable for uh, most, or even accessible for most people in the world. But when we start getting to a fraction of a penny per transaction, we can start doing some in interesting stuff around subsidizing these transactions. And often uh, using some type of centralized infrastructure that sits in between the UI and the blockchain that enables things like DDoS protection in order to kind of make this happen. We also have this idea of a dispatcher, which is something that we're starting to see new, where basically you have um, this centralized server, again, sitting in between the UI and the blockchain, and a user is able to kind of say, OK, I'm going to be interacting with this application, and I'm going to set aside five cents of gas, which may or may not be subsidized by the platform, and I'm going to go ahead and approve that. So now every time I do any interaction, I don't have to sign any transaction. The actual UI is just updating um, without, without having to uh, authorize any request. And investments and innovation in wallet UX, there's really, really great stuff happening here. That's not going to be covered in my talk. But if you've kept up with what's happening in the last year, you might have seen some of those things. But just you're going to see a lot more things that are happening. We have billions of dollars being thrown into this area alone. So let's take a look at uh, some, of, uh, uh, some examples. A great example is a new network that was released a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago, called Arbitrum Nova. Arbitrum Nova uses a data availability committee for data storage, meaning that instead of storing all of the data that's being uh, saved in the application to Ethereum or another blockchain, it's actually using a decentralized uh, committee of essentially like people that guarantee that the data is going to be available for the application and offering some on-chain security guarantees around how that's done while actually not storing the data itself again, like in the actual blockchain. And the way that this is done, it basically has a fallback mechanism, meaning that if the data availability committee somehow like, isn't uh, being truthful, then it will then fall back to storing the data on chain. And this data is actually just being stored in traditional databases that people are kind of like keeping up to date. And it also kind of uses this idea of a sequencer to batch and compress these transactions. And what they've actually been able to achieve is transaction costs that are less than uh, one cent per transaction. It's actually closer to about one-tenth of a cent per transaction. And this is a great use case for non-financial applications, so things like gaming and also for social networks. So uh, Reddit is one of the first companies to actually pick this up for their community points. So with uh, Reddit community points, you as a developer can build gaming, social, and other applications on top of their community point system. Now, why wouldn't they just use a traditional database for this? Well, it, again, it kind of makes sense for, for developers to want to build on top of APIs that they can trust and expect to be around 10 years from now or five years from now. Um, I'm not going to invest a lot of my own time and effort building on someone else's API, to be quite honest, because I know that uh, I'm now depending my business on what their whim and changes are. They, they maintain that infrastructure, and that can go away or that can change at any time. So with Arbitrum Nova, basically, you're kind of having this compromise between security and scalability or accessibility. 
Um, another good example is Lens Protocol. And this is more around a combination of a few of these things. So Lens is a composable and decentralized social graph. A social graph is an application that allows you to create a profile, follow a user, see a feed of content based on the people you're following, post content, and view a feed, again, of other people's stuff. And then there's recommend al uh, recommendation algorithms that kind of make that happen. A couple of examples of this are like TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera. And what this basically is, is a set of smart contracts. And these smart contracts have functions and all these things that you typically would in a regular smart contract. But what they've done is they've built a centralized GraphQL API on top of it that allows any developer, regardless if they're a blockchain developer or not, to interact with the network, not only from reading data, like it's in queries, but also writing transactions. So you're given literally just a GraphQL mutation that you can then call. And in their API, they have this entire set up with uh, a dispatcher configured as well as relayers that allow you to uh, offset and subsidize that gas cost to the network itself. So Lens Protocol is actually subsidizing the transactions, meaning that this as a social network, anyone can use it for free, and anyone can interact with it for free, and you don't need to have any tokens or any of that stuff. All you need to do is just have a basic wallet. Um, there's, it's still in a closed beta, but they already have 50,000 members signed up. and. This is a, a quick uh, uh, example of kind of what this looks like. So you open the app, and it looks you know, and feels just like a traditional application. You can like something. You can, uh, you can retweet something. Essentially, it's kind of like um, called mirroring. You can post images. You can do whatever you want. Everything looks and feels basically like any traditional application. But if you've ever used a blockchain application, you know you have all that signing and all that other stuff to do. That's kind of annoying. But here you see that we're just going to click post. Everything just works, and it just feels like really nice. So that's just a, an overview of what uh, Lens looks like. Lens is built on Polygon, which is another uh, network that offers a compromise between security guarantees and cost, meaning that they have their own implementation that isn't a traditional like layer one or layer two blockchain. It's a side chain. But the transaction costs are so cheap, it allows applications themselves and protocols to subsidize those costs. And then finally, we're going to focus on what I'm ex uh, interested in and working on today, modular blockchains. So modul a modular blockchain is a blockchain that outsources at least one component to an external chain, meaning it doesn't handle all of those components. So the main components of a blockchain are execution, settlement, data availability, and consensus. Most blockchains do all of these things. We've only now really started seeing this idea of separating some of these things kind of almost like we uh, would look like separating things in a microservice architecture uh, recently. And it was... It was an innovation that was kind of thought up by Mustafa al Bassam when he wrote this paper called the Lazy Ledger paper, if you want to dive into that and then learn more about it. But basically, a monolithic chain does all these things. A modular chain just breaks them apart. And we've already started moving in this direction with blockchains, really, when you start thinking about how layer one blockchains no longer are kind of the, the main layer. They're now looked at as a settlement layer. So you now have L2s and roll-ups like Optimism, Arbitrum, and all these other ones like Polygon that do all the execution off-chain, and then they roll up or batch transactions in a roll-up on-chain. So what Celestia and Polygon Avail do, which are the two main ones right now taking this approach, is that they only handle data availability and consensus. And we're going to dive into that in just a moment and see why that's kind of revolutionary in a lot of people's opinions. So what are some of the benefits around taking this approach? One of them is scalability. In the traditional tech stack, scalability is just how high the throughput can be, how many operations and transactions per second can our database and our application use or handle without being compromised, compromising like the experience or the user experience with everything just still working properly. It's a lot more nuanced than that in a blockchain architecture because throughput can be achieved with the expense of decentralization, meaning that, yes, you can just have a single database that handles this massive throughput, but once you start actually uh, distributing that across the network, you start realizing that it's a lot more complicated. So with blockchains, the actual calculation for scalability could be looked at more as a, uh, the function or the, the uh, throughput divided by the cost to validate a transaction by an average user. So when we look at 
blockchains like Solana and Nier, they're very, very fast and they're very inexpensive, but they're a little more centralized than blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are very expensive. So you have this trade-off. So what we're basically all trying to do is figure out a way to achieve the scalability properties of something like Solana or Nier while still maintaining the decentralization of something like Ethereum. So how can we move towards this? Well, let's take a look at how we currently verify transactions. There are two types of blockchain nodes. One is a full node. A full node downloads and verifies all of the data on the chain. So if you're running a full node, you're essentially downloading and processing every transaction that's ever happened to come up with the current state of the chain in order to start understanding what the state is and interacting with the network. So full nodes download and verify all data. They have a very high resource requirement, meaning they have a higher barrier to entry. And they have only a few people doing this because, again, it's a lot more uh, complicated to do that. In reality, though, most people run a light node. A light node doesn't download the entire state. It only downloads block headers, which are really just metadata that kind of tell you what's going on. But you kind of have to trust these light nodes that they're telling the truth because they don't actually verify the data themselves. But the benefits are that they offer a lower barrier to entry because these can often be run on very, with very, very low resource requirements. And most of the people that are participating in the security of a network are often running these light nodes. So what these new blockchains like Celestia and um, Polygon Avail and even Ethereum, the future roadmap of Ethereum are actually also changing to do, to do is implementing this new mechanism called data availability sampling. And data availability sampling is a technique that allows light clients to have almost the exact sec same security guarantees as a full node, meaning that anyone that is running a light client is now giving the network that additional security that's essentially mimicking what a full node would in the past. And in addition to that, it also enables block sizes to increase without compromising decentralization. And the way that this is done is through a technique called erasure coding. Erasure coding is something that we've seen used in the past uh, for a long time on things like a CD-ROM or a CD. If we scratch a CD, we know that like we could potentially mess it up if we scratch it too many times. So if we scratch a, a disk, we're actually messing up, removing some of that memory. But most of the time when we still play that disk, it actually still works, right? Well, that's done because there is actually duplication of data that ends up being able to still rep be able to be read based on the rep uh, erasure coding technique. So what this means in practice is that we now have the ability to scale up the block size along with the usage. So in Ethereum and, and pretty much every other blockchain, the more, time, the more users and more transactions that we have, the cost starts going up because we have less bandwidth. But with, the, with uh, data availability sampling, these idea of a trust minimized light clients, then we are able to actually scale the block size with the actual amount of users. This essentially, you could consider, solves its, to some degree the, the blockchain trilemma, the scalability trilemma. And this brings the same properties as one of the most scalable decentralized networks in the history of computing, which is BitTorrent. Um, so when we kind of like implement this, we're now mimicking some of these same secure or some of these same scalability properties as BitTorrent. Another thing that it helps solve is this scalability execution bottleneck. Again, most blockchains are sharing a single execution environment with every other application, every user of that application. Again, this is like actually absolutely kind of insane when we think about it. This does not scale. We, we, are, we have a finite amount of resources, and we are trying to tell people that if you want to deploy and build on a blockchain, you need to share that execution environment with everyone else. That doesn't make sense for actual massive scale. Instead, we need to take a horizontal scaling approach and then also maybe inherit some of the things that are happening at the execution layer and at the EVM layer, or the, the VM layer. So horizontal scaling is basically adding more power to your current machine. Horizontal scaling is uh, adding more nodes. This is kind of a good visual representation of that. Um, with modular blockchains, we are moving towards a future where we, we kind of already know that they're not going to be just a single blockchain out there because, again, we have dozens and dozens of really great successful networks that exist. We have Near, we have Aleph, who are both here, that are both sponsors, and we have um, Ethereum, we have Polygon, we have uh, Optimism. There's literally just countless ones, and there's new ones coming out every day. We're, what we're getting to is a future of a multi-chain world.
If we're moving to that multi-chain world anyway, and we have people that are building bridging technology that, that enables applications to talk to each other and blockchains to interact with each other, then what we're essentially saying is that why not just allow anyone that needs their own application to deploy their own application-specific blockchain and own their own execution environment for their own user base? And that's, that's the focus of what is enabled via modular blockchains in a couple of different ways. You're able to deploy blockchains directly uh, to the network itself. You're also able to uh, basically inherit some of these other guarantees by deploying to a settlement layer that's deployed to one of these modular blockchains as opposed to using Ethereum, which has a lot of, I would say, backwards compatibility things that it has to deal with. So um, in addition to that, like when we start separating all these concerns, you now have this idea of being able to specialize in each layer. So if each layer is now separated and you don't have to actually have interoperability with everything happening within the system, you can do more to specialize. You have more flexibility. You're able to experiment more because if I can take a, uh, a, a virtual machine that's been open sourced and deploy it myself, why not just make a few minor changes and updates and keep playing around with it and testing it out. So if I, if I like Solana and I want to deploy my own application on Solana, I might fork Solana C-level, make some updates, deploy it. So we're, we're going to see a lot more experimentation like going forward with all this stuff. So if you'd like to learn more, I would check out celestia.org slash learn, docs.celestia.org. And that is it for my talk. Thank you so much for checking it out. If you have any questions, I'll be around the corner.